When we actually have an opening keynote, I do apologize for how long it has taken just to get to it. So I will be brief and introduce you uh, to Michael Horn. Michael Horn is the co-author of Disrupting Class. He's a graduate of the Harvard Business School, and before that, a graduate of Yale. And he's a snappy dresser. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Michael Horn. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, greatly appreciate this audience. Good morning, everyone. And it's good to be here in my home state where I live, speaking to educators working to make California not the, just the youth a better place, but the state a better place. So thank you for all that you do up front. And thank you to Mike and his wonderful team. He just, you know, he, he was embarrassed there that the slides were out of order at the end. I can't believe how many different presentations you're juggling while you're speaking. <laughs> So uh, big, big thank you again to being such great hosts. I, I'm thrilled to be here again. As Mike said, I'm the co-author of this book called Disrupting Class, How Disruptive Innovation Will Change the Way the World Learns. And I co-authored it uh, with this gentleman uh, at the Harvard Business School whose name is Clayton Christensen. And when Clay entered academia over two decades ago, he brought with him this interesting question, which was, I wonder why successful organizations fail. wonder why successful organizations fail. And if you step back from it for a second and, and you think about it, it's actually a rather interesting question, right? Because why bad organizations fail, you know, that's fairly obvious. But why successful ones, the best of the best, with great people, great employees, great managers, great processes, great track record, why they fail, that's a lot less obvious. And yet it's what we see consistently through the sweep of history. Be it in business history, you see that the uh, companies that are once at the top, a generation or two later, are invariably in the middle of the pack or even the bottom of the heap. You see it in countries, right, the rise and fall of great nations. You see this over and over again. And as he studied this question, he reached this, this really counterintuitive conclusion for a professor at the Harvard Business School, which I have a feeling is not so counterintuitive to people here, which was, it was actually the very principles of good management taught at places like Harvard that while helpful on the way up, ultimately spelled every organization's demise. And so Mike said that I was a graduate of the Harvard Business School, so I will be candid. After I graduated, I worked with Clay not just to write Disrupting Class, but also to unlearn everything I had learned there and I come to you in that spirit today. So, thank you. You're not the only ones to applaud for that. Um, so, what I want to do today is that when we approach the questions of education, we took a pretty different tactic from what most uh, researchers who study education do. Most people study education from within education and so forth, but we came from this totally other field of innovation, having studied how do you make innovation and success in innovation far more predictable and successful and repeatable? And how can we help these organizations that had been struck by these things that seemed not quite right for such successful organizations, how can we help them to avoid these pitfalls? And like I said, unlearn what had been learned. And so we took these theories of innovation, which have become known as the theories of disruptive innovation, to help organizations more predictably innovate and we basically stuck them on like a set of lenses. And we looked at the problems that education and schools struggle with from outside and said, you know, a lot of these problems are basically problems of managing innovation. And if we can look at it through these theories, maybe we can just see a few things that other people hadn't seen before and give educators and schools and the education system a way to grab hold of these principles so that they can innovate to solve these struggles. And that's very much what we uh, did in the, in, in the course of this book. And so what I want to do today is walk you through a few of the theories from our research, and I'm going to apply it to things very different from education at first. And just to the point where you're saying, what does this have to do with me, and you're getting a little antsy, we'll do a pivot, and we'll say, okay, what does it might mean for education? And I want to be clear, I'm not trying to give answers today, but what I hope I, that you leave with 
is a new understanding of why innovation actually is not this wildly unpredictable process that seems so chaotic at times, how you can make it more predictable, but more importantly, a language so that you can talk amongst yourselves to come up with the solutions to the struggles that we all face every single day. The answers won't be from me, but I think the answers are right out here in this room. So with that uh, in mind, what I first want to do is, is launch into this key theory that emerged from his research to explain why organizations that were the most successful failed, which became known as this theory of disruptive innovation. And what I've done here on, your, on the uh, screens is plot on the y-axis performance, and it's over time on the x-axis. And what this represents is a marketplace or a sector or a field. And what we see in every sector is that there are two trajectories in this uh, diagram. The first one is this relatively flat line. It's the pace of performance that customers can utilize or absorb over time. And the reason it's relatively flat is that our basic things we've got to do as people every day don't actually change that much from day to day, right? Things that you had to get done yesterday or something like what you're going to have to do today and something like the problems you have to solve tomorrow. Our basic lives don't change that much from day to day. Now, of course, there are a range. There's some people at the low end who are satisfied with very little in the way of performance. And there's some people at the high end who we all have to work with who are never satisfied no matter how much you give them. But we basically have these trajectories in our lives. Now, there's a second line, and this one is really interesting. It's the pace of technological progress. And what it says is that whenever a new technology comes out, it starts out over there on the left-hand side of that graph as not good enough for the majority of users in a field. But what it also says is that technology improves faster than do our lives change. Technology improves faster than do our lives change. So what at one point is not good enough for the majority of users in a field, over time packs in more and more functions and features and performance such that it actually overserves what most of us could possibly use from it. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Do, uh, how many of you remember the early personal computers in the 1980s? Yes. So you remember strolling up at those personal computers? Yes, yeah, some, some of you still have them in your schools. So. <laughs> Memo to California. Uh, so, uh, you remember strolling up to those machines and you'd start clacking away on those things and you'd be doing a little word processing? And what happened? Every once in a while you'd have to stop, right? And coax the stupid thing to catch up with your fingers. You remember that? It's because the basic Intel 286 chip inside those early machines wasn't even good enough for a basic application like word processing, right? But true to form, Intel improved that microprocessor year over year over year until now they introduced Pentium multi-core or whatever processors that greatly overserve the ability of an ordinary simple user like myself who only runs one PowerPoint at a time <laughs> to need all of the speed that they can provide. Now, sometimes that march up that blue line are just small little incremental year-to-year -year improvements. Other times they're giant breakthrough leaps forward. But what we realized is that these two types of innovation are actually fundamentally the same kind of innovation. And we call it a sustaining innovation because it sustains that blue line, that trajectory, to allow the organizations to make better products and services in the ways that they're set up to build products and services to serve even more demanding users and to actually serve the best users. And what we noticed was that incumbents, the leading organizations at the beginning of that blue line, are nearly always the winners and leaders at the end of that blue line. The reason is they're so motivated to serve their best users and often make better profits or better revenues that no matter how technologically demanding or just mundane the innovation, they're highly motivated to figure out how to get it done. So occasionally you'll see some young startup company or organization come out with some high-flying, newfangled thing, and they'll try to leapfrog the leaders and they'll get a lot of headlines. But if you keep close watch, what you'll see is after the battles are over, those leading organizations will generally have won. And the startups will either have withdrawn, become a niche player, or maybe even been, become acquired. We see it very consistently. Now, 
what I've done is push that diagram into the back plane there. And the leading products or services in the original plane tend to be complicated, expensive, inaccessible, very centralized. And as a result, they only serve a select few people who have enough expertise or wealth to use those products or services. And there's a whole bunch of people we call non-consumers who do not have the wealth or expertise to use these products. But occasionally, there's a different kind of innovation that comes along that changes the game. And we call this one, it's a horrible name, but we call this one a disruptive innovation. I say it's a horrible name because disruptive uh, implies a lot of things in the English language. In education, many of them are not so good. Uh, but it also implies that breakthrough leap forward, but it's not at all what we mean by the term. What we instead mean by the word disruptive innovation is something that brings forth a product or service that's actually not as good as the leading one is judged by the historical measures of performance, but it brings forth a new value proposition around simplicity, affordability, accessibility, convenience, far more decentralized, and as a result of simplifying the world, it's able to serve these people, non-consumers, right, who didn't have access to the leading one in the back plane to begin with. And these non-consumers are delighted with this disruptive innovation because to them it doesn't look that bad at all because it's better than their alternative, right, which was nothing at all. And it's infinitely better than that. And it gets started in this new plane of competition. And true to form, the disruptive innovation gets better and better and better, starts to be able to do the complicated things in the back plane. One by one, that starts to come out into the new plane. And the users come with it because they want a simpler, more affordable product or service as well. And that's how transformation in field after field takes place through this process of disruptive innovation. And what we see is that entrance nearly always win the battles of disruptive innovation. For some reason, disruptive innovation almost always trips up those leading companies. They just have a really tough time grabbing hold of this disruptive innovation. Startups and new organizations tend to win these battles. So as we studied why this was, there happened to be a story in the 1970s and 80s that unfolded out of my old hometown in Massachusetts uh, that helped to explain this in great detail. So how many of you remember the company Digital Equipment uh, Corporation, or DEC? Okay, so a handful, right? DEC, if you remember, was the leading company of the 1970s and 80s, right? Sort of the Google of that era. And they built this product called Mini Computers. Now, Mini Computers was a bit of a misleading name because they weren't actually particularly small but they were significantly smaller than mainframes. But a mini computer was about the size of this here podium. Okay? And DEC was just the best company in the world at selling mini computers that were unbelievably uh, complex machines that did unbelievably uh, complicated tasks for very demanding users. And they sold them for quarter million dollars on average and just were really, really fabulously successful. And whenever you'd go to publications like Business Week and say, why are these guys so good? They said the same thing every time. Not only do they have the best engineers in the world, but they also have the smartest leaders and managers. The implication being if you guys were just as smart as they were, you too could be wildly successful and be the best company in the world. And these guys just make the right decision year over year over year. Well, an interesting thing happened in 1989 to this high-flying company deck. Within six months, the business literally just collapsed, literally fell off a cliff within just six months. And so you'd go back to Business Week and say, what happened to these guys? And they'd say, those stupid managers running the company, very same people running it, those stupid managers, if only they had seen the personal computer coming, they could have grabbed hold of it and transformed the world, but they missed the boat, so they're going to be consigned to the ashtray of history. Now, so this is often our explanation, right, whenever we see organizations fail, which is we assign it to stupid management, right? But the explanation did not make sense in this case because every single mini computer business collapsed in unison. Data General, Prime, Wang, every single one. And while you would expect companies to collude on price occasionally, 
to collude, to collapse, was just a pure stretch of the imagination. So the question couldn't be why did smart managers decide to become stupid, but instead what was fundamentally happening that led this to happen to all of these organizations. When you dug back in the story, indeed you, see, you saw something happen, and it was not a story of stupid management, but indeed one of smart management. If you looked at the business plans that managers were seeing at that time, they were saying, right now you uh, charge your customers quarter million dollars, 45% gross margins, we've been doing what the whiz kids at the Harvard Business School tell us to do, listening to our best customers. And holy cow, they said if you would build the next generation mini computer with even more demanding uh, functions and features, they'd be delighted to give you half a million dollars on 60% gross margins. Another group came to them and said, you guys just don't get it, do you? If you just get up out of your seat, look outside the window occasionally, you'd see there's this thing coming called the personal computer, and I'm telling you, it's going to change the world. So management, they got up out of their seats, they saw the personal computer, they even built three or four of them, but they also saw a few other things. Because as we already discussed, right, do you remember how primitive the personal computer was at the beginning? It could barely do word processing, let alone the demanding computations and calculations that DEC's best customers needed done. And so then DEC's salespeople would take the machine that they had built to their customers and say, hey, look what we got, would you buy one? And they'd say, not a chance, it can't do anything we need done. And then they looked at the business plans which promised uh, you could charge $2,000 on them for 40% gross margins in the good years that were quickly gonna collapse to 20%. And the decision management, in essence, faced was this. Should we build better products for our best customers for even better profits? Or should we build worse products that our customers can't use and won't buy for profits that would kill our business model? What should we do? And it's a real innovator's dilemma, right? Because the very logical thing to go up market is the very thing that if you don't somehow figure out how to do the thing at the low end, quote unquote, will kill you in the long run. So they did the logical thing, and we know how the story turned out. Interesting question, how did Apple do it? How did Apple and the other personal computers transform the world? Well, in the case of Apple, they had a really good asset coming in, which was that they had no customers. <laughs> so they got to ask a really cool question. I wonder who would want a personal computer? Do you remember who they sold the first personal computer to? I, be, even before education, as a toy to children right, toy to children and hobbyists who couldn't afford a quarter million dollar computer and were just delighted with this quote unquote crummy machine and it got better and better and better and by 1989 could do all of these demanding, uh, not all of them, but a significant amount of the demanding computations and calculations swept the volume out of the market and transformed the world. Great thing for all of us because now we had affordable computing at our fingertips. Not so great for DEC. So a question then is, what are these leading organizations doing when they see these potentially disruptive innovations coming along? And for this story, I wanna go back to the 1950s and 60s. Excuse me, actually. Let me just tell you actually that we see this sweep through the fields uh, in lots of other fields besides computing and so forth, right? So in, in the blue column, I've, I've put a, a list of the companies whose stock we wish we had owned over the last couple decades. If you're like me, you didn't own any of them. Uh, and they've disrupted those companies in red who in their own right were disruptive in their own heyday. And so you can look at these and say like, look at automobiles for example. Toyota has largely disrupted GM and Ford and, uh, and Chrysler even more specifically over the last several decades, right? How did Toyota do it? They didn't come in at the high end with the high flying Lexus out of the gate that everyone here drove into the parking lot this morning. They started at the low end with this crummy car called a Corona. Anyone own a Corona before I say anything else? Yes, good job, Michael. So this car rusted pretty quickly. It wasn't near as good as the gas guzzling cars that Detroit was shoving down people's throats. But for people who couldn't afford those gas guzzling cars, this was just a blessing, right? And they started with that car, the Corona, went up market to the Tercel, and then the Corolla, the Camry, the Avalon, the Forerunner, and then the Lexus and changed the world. To be fair to Detroit's managers, they were not totally asleep at the wheel. 
they saw these guys coming from the low end, and every once in a while they said, you know, we really ought to go down there and compete with those buggers. So what'd they do? They send down a Pinto or a Chevette. <laughs> but when they compared the margins of selling one of those vehicles with the unmitigated blessing of being able to spell, uh, sell yet another Cadillac, Escalade, or Ford Explorer, it just didn't make any sense, right? So they'd withdraw, retreat, seed more ground, and by the time it was too late, we know what happened, uh, or just ask the government. But interestingly enough, Toyota over the last few years has been being disrupted. Until recently when they accelerated into the future, they didn't feel it because they had, <laughs> because they had the privilege of stealing market share from uh, companies like Mercedes-Benz. But they've been being disrupted for the last uh, few years. Does anyone know by whom? Kia and Hyundai, right? The Koreans, yeah. And actually, they're not being too shy about it either. This is a commercial that Hyundai is uh, running right now. Isn't it time someone did to Lexus what Lexus did to Mercedes? They're coming right at them. They own the subcompact, compact ends. They win all the quality awards now. Underneath them are Chinese and Cherry. And of course, underneath them are Indians and Tata. We don't ever need to worry about them, because I'm sure they'll never be good enough. But uh, department stores, largely disrupted by discount and retail. Walmart, Kmart, Target. Target went up market and became Target. Online retail is coming up underneath them. Uh, if you look at the second to last one there, isn't that interesting? State universities, now community colleges educate over 50% of post-secondary students in this country. And where's all the growth? Online universities, right? Over 20% a year right now. Very interesting in the pain that that's causing our state flagship universities and so forth. So it happens not just in for-profit industries as well by any means. We see it all over the sectors. Now, like I said, what are the uh, organizations doing when they see a potentially disruptive innovation? For this story, I will go back to the 1950s and 60s when the dominant consumer electronic products of the time were powered by things called vacuum tubes. If you remember vacuum tubes, they were about the size of your fist, right? They blew out every once in a while, but they enabled unbelievably demanding uh, uh, consumer electronics for that era. And what we saw was that uh, these uh, leading companies, the leading vacuum tube companies at the time, RCA and Zenith and so forth, uh, were powered by these machines, and they saw in 1947 out of Bell Labs, the uh, transistor uh, come out. And uh, the transistor was this really interesting technology that could not power their unbelievably demanding tabletop radios and floor standing televisions. But it was intriguing because it was a lot more durable. It was smaller and everyone knew it had some potential. So they all took a license to it and then did what we generally do. They framed the problem as a technology problem saying if we invest enough money in perfecting this transistor, we'll make it good enough such that we'll just plug it in for our vacuum tubes and our users won't know the difference and they'll keep buying our products. But the technological hurdle that that re represented at that time was very high. And despite spending over a billion dollars RCA and the vacuum tube companies never got there. Now, how did the transistor ultimately train, change the world? Got it start out in this plane of non-consumption, right? In 1952, uh, this company introduced the hearing aid. Now, the vacuum tube was totally impractical for a hearing aid. <laughs> and it required very little power, so the transistor was just perfect for it. And from starting there, in 1955, this little company called Sony introduced this crummy little product called the pocket transistor radio. Who did they market the first pocket transistor radio to? Teenagers, the low end of humanity, right? <laughs> because they knew that they would be delighted with this because it was far better than their alternative, nothing at all. And then they went up market to the uh, portable television, sold it to non-consumers with small apartments that couldn't afford the big floor standing TVs, got better and better and better, and they changed the world not by taking dead aim and by framing it as a technology problem, but realizing that the key was the model in which it was being used and who, where you started. And by framing it as a technology problem and cramming it into the way they had always done business, RCA and all the vacuum tube companies, despite spending way more money than Sony ever did, 
ultimately we're not the ones to change the world and we're changed by it. Now, for time's sake, I'm gonna skip this theory even though it's really, really fascinating. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the point of it though in a second and talk about for a second uh, about education. And I wanna start with something that we all know, which is that all of us, students, adults, all of us, we all have different learning needs and goals at different times, right? Now there's some irony, of course, of me lecturing to you right now because you all have my learning need and goal, but we basically know that we have these differences. I'd argue that educators know this far more than most people, but academics over the last couple decades have begun to catch up to the party. This is a whole list of the different uh, schematics that academics are using to think about these differences now. There's a lot of contention over this, but this whole notion that we learn differently and have different learning needs really started in 1983 in the academic literature with the publication of Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. Now, Professor Gardner, as many of you know, uh, has eight different multiple intelligences that he talks about these days, basically asserting that not only do we have these familiar processes and cognitive abilities like verbal linguistic or logical mathematical, but that we have other ones like bodily kinesthetic, basically asserting that the ability of the basketball players from San Diego State or UCLA to do what they did yesterday, anyone from San Diego or UCLA, okay, uh, were resident in the capabilities in their mind, right? Now, a lot of people have pushed back on this, and this is basically all of the academic food fights shown on this, uh, on this slide here. So talents, some people say no, it's motivations, interests, and engagement. Other people say aptitudes. Some people say learning styles. More and more research says that's not right. The one thing no one disagrees on is that we all come to different topics with different background knowledge and different background experiences. We have different passions. We have some measure of different aptitudes. And gosh, we learn at different paces. Some people grab onto a subject really quickly. Other people have to struggle with it a little bit more, play around with it until it really becomes familiar with them. Now, if we have these different learning needs and different goals at different times in our lives, wouldn't you expect that the education system would be built to customize for those differences? But as we know from our experience, that's basically not the case. Now, there are some exceptions. I was with an educator last night at dinner who had run an incredible classroom where she had set this up, and there are certainly instances of that, but basically, the system is a highly interdependent system whose economics compel it to standardize the way we teach and test. Now, should you doubt me, think back to your own experience in high school. Maybe you were in the uh, geometry class and you were in the middle of a three-week unit. What happened at the end of the three-week unit? Took a test and then you moved on. Didn't matter whether you understood every concept or not but we all moved on. Maybe you were in the world history class and it was a year long class and you were able to master the material in just a couple of months. What happened? You sat there for the whole course, growing bored by what for you were stuff you already knew. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? It's not the fault of educators. Educators know this. We have a system that was built on a factory model to process students in batches, add value, ship them out on the other end. And the economics of this highly interdependent system, as we discuss in the book, compels standardization. It's prohibitively expensive to really customize for different individual learning needs in this system. Think about how much it costs to design an individualized learning plan for a special needs student. Two to three times on average, and if there are special needs educators in here, you'll quickly attack me afterwards and say it would actually cost far more were we to truly individualize, we just don't have the budgets. And this just clashes with this need that we know for customization. Now, had I not skipped the theory before, what you would have immediately leapt to before was that the answer to this is to migrate to a more modular system because modularity allows for plug and play allows for different paths, allows for affordable customization. And the question is, how might we think about 
what a modular system would look like. And so in the book, what we pose is that schools do lots of different jobs in our lives, only one of which is academic. But if we thought about migrating the academic job to the platform of the computer for the delivery of lessons and so forth, not replacing the teacher by any means, but by changing the role, this would be inherently modular, right? So Michael Horn could have one path for him to learn physics, and gosh, after spending a night with Mike last night, he would have a totally different path. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what his would involve. Mine would involve a lot of sports analogies. Uh, and he would go a lot faster than I would. Now, it's intuitive that we could do this, but it raises a problem, which is that, as you all know, computers have been around for three decades. And by and large across the country, we've been spending pretty heavily on them for the last couple decades in schools. But they haven't actually changed the model of this factory model system. They haven't transformed teaching and learning like we see the potential of them to. And if we're being honest about that, and we think about why, it's because schools, like all organizations, have done what they naturally do when they see a potentially disruptive innovation, which is to cram it into the existing operating model. And so we've shoved computers into the back of classrooms, and not teachers here but elsewhere have said you can do a little bit of PowerPoint, you can do a little Microsoft Word, a little internet research. But we haven't fundamentally transformed how teaching and learning and the classroom structure itself and how these all fit together actually work. Now, what the theories of disruptive innovation point to is that if we could take this and put it in a different model and within online learning or other structures and target it at first at non-consumption, areas in that green space where the alternative is literally nothing at all, gradually we could actually start to transform this school system from the monolithic factory model one we have into a student-centric one that affordably customizes for the different individual learning needs that every child has so that they can realize their human potential. It brings up another mystery, which is in the United States, where would these areas of non-consumption be? In developing countries, it's fairly obvious. There's, lot, there's millions, literally millions and millions of students that do not have access to school. 70 million in primary grades, 200 million in secondary. But where in the United States would it be? Turns out that the level is not at schools, but indeed at class, in individual courses, and so forth. And if you start to see it from that prism, there's a reason the book is not called Disrupting Schools, it's called Disrupting Class. You actually see that there's lots of areas of non-consumption in our K-12 school system that we can start to shoot these different innovations, try different things, iterate, and ultimately transform the system. Now, this list is greatly expanded from the one in the book. It's a product, honestly, of traveling around the country and being with people like you who have said, you know, you didn't think about X. And so credit recovery is a big area of non-consumption in our schools, right? If a student fails a course right now, often there's no way for them to make up the credit. They either move on or do a summer school packet that doesn't really work and uh, often don't graduate as a result of it. Online learning is a great way to start to get them on track. Not as good as having a teacher deliver the lesson right in front of you, maybe at the outset, but better than the alternative, nothing at all, and improving day by day. Uh, dropouts are a huge area of non-consumption. In the state of California, nearly 200,000 students did not graduate last year. 200,000 students, roughly a 30 to 35 percent dropout rate. Huge area of non-consumption where we can set up alternative school sites and so forth to give students an opportunity to learn with the schedules that make sense for them far more flexibly and so forth. Uh, AP and advanced courses, big area of non-consumption as well. Advanced placement courses, that's probably known to you, but if you look at rural schools in particular, small rural, often urban schools as well, 25% of high schools in the United States do not offer an advanced course. Defined as anything above geometry, so no algebra two, forget about calculus. And we have a STEM problem, by the way, they tell us. Defined as anything above biology, so no chemistry, no physics. And defined as any honors English class period. Huge areas of non-consumption where we can begin to make a difference. 
Now, you see the rest of this list. I'm not going to go into it. But a lot of the looming budget cuts and teacher shortages that we hear right now about, particularly in the California news, that are huge threats to the way we've always operated our schools, if we were to change our perspective and look at this as a strategic opportunity, it wouldn't be the bloodletting that we see it being right now. We could ask ourselves, what can we do uniquely in the school building and what can we use online learning to continue to still be able to offer? And how do we make this work and transform the system into a student-centric one? Now, the question obviously is, is online learning growing in accordance with a disruptive innovation that you really believe will uh, change the delivery model of education in the United States? And the answer actually is, in high school it is. Now, whenever you see a disruptive innovation come on the scene, it follows this S-curve pattern. In the early years of the S-curve on that flat part, people come into uh, the sector, they try out the new innovation, they play with it, they iterate real quickly and so forth, and uh, it's not real good in the beginning, and at some point, the world flips, and it gets really good, and people rapidly adopt it, and then it levels off at the top. The problem is, if you're on the early part of that S-curve, how do you know if an S-curve is actually going to develop? Because, right, it could be a flat line to nowhere. It could be a really steep S-curve. It could be a really shallow one. It turns out that there's actually a way to, to predict it. If you plot on the y-axis the percent of the new technology divided by the percent of the old, and you put it on a logarithmic scale, so that 0.001 is equidistant from 0.01 from 0.1, and so 50% divided by 50% equals 1.0. It turns out that it linearizes that S-curve such that if the uh, early data points are falling on a straight line, you can predict when the market will hit 25, 50, 80% and so forth. And it turns out that in high school courses, we see such an S-curve developing. And we make this bold projection in disrupting class that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses will be offered online in some form or fashion. So computers will be indeed very relevant in the future of education. Now, when we came out with this prediction, I'll be candid, people thought we were absolutely nuts. They said this could never happen. You guys are crazy. Interesting thing happened that I'll just tell you was something we received, which was six months in, for some reason it changed, and everyone said, we still think you're nuts, don't worry about that, but we think you're actually way too conservative on your projection. I sort of take the fifth on it because it's not the point. What we really want to see is a student-centric system. I don't really care how it's delivered. I want a student-centric system that enables every child to have the experience that they need to have. But there is a lot of evidence that this is growing. Over 4 million K-12 students took at least one online course last year, according to Ambient Insight. And another data point, in 2009, according to Project Tomorrow, 27% of high school students took at least one online course. So it seems actually change is coming. Now, an interesting question is, will this be a good thing? And will it actually transform the world into a student-centric one? We can see the potential, right? We all know the potential of technology. That's why we're here. But will it actually happen? And there's some really positive reasons to hope here. And there's some reasons for concern as well. Now, the positive reasons are that it's predictably improving. If you looked at the early instances of online learning, and for many of you when I said that, you probably thought distance learning. Not the case anymore. The majority of online learning is now incurring in what we call blended learning environments. With a teacher there, in schools, in a brick and mortar place. I'll give you a definition even of blended learning that from a report that we just released about a month and a half ago. It's any time a student learns in part at a supervised brick and mortar facility outside of the home, plus at least in part through online delivery, where the student has some control of time, place, path, and or pace. So some element of the student taking that control. And that's what equals blended learning. Another thing about the definition is that this is from the perspective of a student. So that if a student in your district is taking one online course and the rest in traditional, they're a blended learning student. It excludes the examples like what I'm doing right now. So where a teacher is using a whiteboard to project online content and lecture at students. Irony is totally noted. 
And it excludes examples where students use online textbooks instead of hard copy ones. Okay? Now, it's also improving in the communication vehicles. Uh, joking aside, you saw what Mike was able to do with Skype and with FaceTime on the technology. These communication vehicles are improving literally <laughs> every month. The ability to actually communicate with peers and teachers, students and so forth all around the world and connect is becoming amazing. And as 3D screens and so forth become a reality, who knows where this is going to take us in the next 10 years? It's pretty exciting to think about, though. The third way that it's improving is that the content itself is finally becoming more engaging. If you looked back 15 years ago at the start of online learning, it was some pretty bad stuff. You clicked through a PowerPoint, similar to this one, you answered a few multiple choice questions, and you still see this, for some policy reasons we'll discuss in a second. But we're starting to see the content become engaging. This is a screenshot from the first full uh, online video game-based American history course that the Florida Virtual School uh, debuted a couple years ago. It's called Conspiracy Code, and in it, students run 10 missions to save American history from becoming corrupted. Many of you may already be joking that it's too late, but <laughs> for many students, it's a deeply engaging and enriching way for them to learn the history, and the studies are showing that for many students, it's, a, it, it's working very well. Now, importantly, it's not for every student, and that's just the point, right? Because we're trying to individualize for different student needs. Now, we're starting to see this. We're seeing public schools grab onto this pretty quickly. 39 states have some form of online learning initiative. 30 states um, have a supplemental state-led program where they're doing these course by course. Districts are increasingly getting into the game. This is really now a district story, increasingly, where you see districts grabbing hold of online learning to serve the non-consumers in their midst, be they dropout recovery, credit recovery, advanced courses, or homeschoolers who have left the traditional school system. You're really seeing this explode. Question is, will it really result in the student-centric system? And here's where the questions are on the practical implications, which I could have retitled policy implications. And this is where you can come in to really help push how we think about this field. First of all, actually, before I get into this, let me say one thing, which is as teachers and as uh, administrators and as educators in this field, when you see organizations coming to you with these sorts of tools or sorts of technologies that aren't good enough for what you need, be a consumer and tell them what you need and make them make it better. What we demand will ultimately drive what the, what the companies innovate. They won't do it on their own unless we demand it, and it, unless we pay for that. Now, what we right now pay for is seat time, right? So we've been rewarding the wrong, we've been judging and, and, and so forth the wrong end of the student for the last 50 some odd years. <laughs> we basically measure how long you sit in a seat rather than how much you learn. And we pay that way. And so there's very little incentive right now in policy to make these really dynamic blockbuster things for education as a result. What we need to do is move away from the seat time to competency-based learning, because online learning and so forth, it doesn't make sense to be judging it based on seat time. Time can be variable, learning can be constant, we need to open up different pathways. Rules in California like geographic boundaries that say you can only serve students if they're in your district or a contiguous district. This is crazy for a medium that knows no geographic boundaries, that has literally redefined Silicon Valley for everyone because of it. Uh, you heard Mike already on teacher certification, so I won't go into that anymore, but very important because the old way we've thought about certifications, state by state and so forth, we've got to cut across those lines now. Q is going to be leading that. The uh, fourth one, in general, moving beyond these focus on inputs and processes, documenting when a student was online, were they in their seat, were they in ADA, come on, let's focus on the learning, let's focus on the outcomes. Self-sustaining funding mechanisms so that the technology growth has a way to grow is really important. Utah just adopted uh, legislation around this. Florida's had it in a piece of theirs for some time. California can do better here, too. I, I, I won't go into too many more of these. I, just one more thing, because we've just talked about uh, blended learning and we've talked about competency-based learning. 
And let's talk about the teacher role for just briefly. Teachers are going to be absolutely critical in this new world, right? It will not be the sage on the stage like I am right now. There will be some who I'm sure are brilliant co content experts. There will be many who are the guide on the side, who are mentoring, motivating, pushing, problem solving for students every single day. This should open ourselves up as we see these blended learning models arise to team teaching and really exciting innovations. Using technology not as the end in itself, but student learning as the one. And it's an exciting opportunity. We don't know what it's going to look like, but that's why you guys are going to shape it. And so what I'll tell you one more thing is we really recently released this blended learning report. We're going to release a longer one uh, in uh, just another month or so. It's going to profile 40 actors, including schools from San Diego, Riverside, uh, San Francisco, and so forth, that are doing interesting blended learning things. It's not going to capture everything. And we're going to have a user-generated format on our website at www.innocideinstitute.org so that you can get in the conversation, too, and tell us what you're doing so that we can start to make these practices known all over the place. This is really important because we're going to define the future, and we're going to define it for students and make the student-centric learning a reality. Thank you so much for all that you do. I really appreciate being a part of this. Thank you.